<clears throat> so, oh, Lord have mercy. Sometimes these intelligent things are so intelligent that you cannot, it won't do what you want it to do. How about we just do this? And Does anybody have any idea what's going on here? No. Nope, me either. All right, let's pray one more time. Father in heaven, Lord, please. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principality, against the powers of the, and the rulers of the darkness of this world. Lord, I don't know how to make the computer obey, but all things are subject to thy word. So Lord, speak the word and help us in Christ's name, amen. All right, so we're going to be studying today about how to pray, and I'll tell you that there are subjects in the scriptures that the enemy doesn't care if you know, but there are certain subjects that he wants to make sure that you don't know, and the Bible says, my people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. What does that mean? <clears throat> what it means is, is that, is that the enemy understands it's what you don't know that can hurt you. You've heard the statement that, you know, what you don't know, what you, well, you know, people say what you don't know can't hurt you. Well, that's the exact opposite of the truth. What you don't know can destroy you. And so today we're going to be talking about, <laughs> however it works out, Today we're going to be talking about how to pray. Yeah, and so this is just going to be, I'm just going to switch. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? Second screen only. There you go. <clears throat> All right. So... When it comes to truth, Father in heaven, we'll just leave it like that. We studied before about what happens when a prophet dies. Um, and we were studying about the struggle for the prophetic heritage. And today we're going to be talking about how you can have power in your Christian experience. Power is the thing that the enemy doesn't want you to have. That's it. Because he understands this one thought, that if you can access power then you can defeat him and all of his and anything that he ever tries to do to you. So it doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter what happened to you. It doesn't matter if you were molested as a little girl or a little boy. It doesn't matter if you were beat up or bullied. It doesn't matter if you were big or if you were fat or if you were skinny or if you had struggles or if you were preemie or if you were overweight. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> what matters is that you can literally plug in to omnipotent power so that you never, ever have a lack. And this subject is so serious that the enemy will do anything to make sure you don't have it. It doesn't matter if you're Mexican or if you're black. It doesn't matter if you were born in America or born outside of America. It doesn't matter. Because God loves you, and he's come, has sent his son, so that you can plug in to power. So, today's subject, how to pray. 
Okay? Now I'm going to put this up here on the screen. Oh, you know what? I know exactly what to do. I believe that's it. All right. <clears throat> Forgive me. There we go. All right. So, sometimes in life, there are connections that you have that drain you of the power that God intends for you to have. What I just did was I unplugged the monitor television. It's not being used. And I plugged in directly. So, in our study of God's word, this is, an, this is the gospel. This is what God, the pattern that God gave to Moses. This is the way of salvation. <clears throat> the cross is not the end of salvation. The cross is the way that will lead you to where the Father is. Amen. See, the Father is in heaven, and he wants you to come and to be with him. But before you can come to be with him, before you can see his face, there has to be a change that's made. Now, the Father is perfect. He doesn't need to change. But you and I, we recognize because we're sinners, we come here from the world and we come and we meet Christ at the cross. And we fall down at the cross and we are broken upon the rock, Christ Jesus. And then when we're broken, we are washed and baptized and here we have fellowship with the saints. But see, you and I cannot go into here. This is only where the priest can go. <clears throat> Excuse me. See, only the priest can go into the holy place and the most holy. But you and I are to know what the priest is doing because the priest worked for us. He doesn't work for himself. He serves both God and man. And so there is a time period. And this is very interesting because here, does anybody know what this is called? Table of showbread. Anybody in here know what the table of showbread represents? Can I get a microphone? and send out my youngest son so that he can come pass it around. Take off your jacket, son. He's coming. If you know what the table of showbread represents, take off your jacket, I don't care, let's go. Raise your hand if you know what the table of showbread represents. Come on, son. Go ahead, raise your hand in the very back. Go see your mom. Go ahead. Um, the, the 12 loaves, um, well, it's the 12 um, disciples, or is that it? Isn't okay. It 12? And then you have the 12 tribes. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. And also, All right. The bread of life. Jesus being okay. the bread of life. Okay. The bread of life. That's very good. Anyone else? Go with me in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of John, chapter 6. John, chapter 6. <clears throat> John, chapter 6. When you get there, just say amen. Amen. All right. We're in John, chapter 6. All right, excuse me. Forgive me. Um, actually, I have it. I just go to John chapter six and we're gonna look at um, 
verse 35, and we'll start with verse 32. Look what the Bible says. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you, ye, that ye also have seen me and believe not. All right. Jesus said he is the bread of life. The bread represents the word of God. But what's interesting is, is that the bread representing the word of God, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. See, the Bible is of no use unless it becomes a part of your life. See, the book sitting on the shelf, making sure that nothing sat on top of it, that's no good. It's not a book of magic. It's not a powerful relic. The Bible is a book of principles and patterns. Go with me in your Bible to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> Excuse me. 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse 3. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. 2 Peter 1 verse 3. Look what the Bible says. <clears throat> Excuse me. According as his divine power hath given unto us how much things? All things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious what? Promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through what? Lust. And so when you and I come in and we begin our experience with God here at the cross. See, those that teach you that the cross, everything was done at the cross, are deceivers. Whether they're honest or dishonest, I don't know. But the Bible's very clear. The cross is not the, the end of your experience, it's the beginning of your experience. Because the Bible says, go with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 28. Matthew, chapter 28. Watch this. <clears throat> I'm sorry, but we went on our trip and everyone got sick. And I think I was the last one to get sick, so I'm the, the groggiest one. I'll tell you a little bit more about it. It says, Matthew 28. And look what the Bible says in verse 18. It says this. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, How much power? All power is given unto me where? In heaven and where? In earth. Look what the Bible says. Go ye therefore and do what? Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Doing what? Teaching, teaching them. So now watch this. You, bat you, you, you teach them, then you baptize them, and then you teach them again. There are certain lessons you can never learn until you get married. Listen to me. You can live with your girlfriend. You can, you can be shacked up. But being shacked up is not going to teach you the lessons that marriage does. Because you know what happens? Listen to me. Honey, stand up, please. I apologize for what I'm about to do. I absolutely love you. All right. Turn around and face everybody. So this is my wife. Her father said to me, if you hurt her, I will kill you when he gave me permission to marry her. And I kind of tried to make a joke out of it, like, <laughs> what if she hurts me? He goes, I'm not playing. See, he wanted me to understand. No, 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 not yet. Not yet. He wanted me to understand that marriage is a covenant of death. See, when you're living with somebody, you not you just think, you know what, if it don't work out, I'm out. Peace. Deuces. You know what, I'm taking me and my stuff and we're going to my place. But see, I need you to understand something. 
What the Lord is saying here is there are certain things people cannot learn about Christianity until after they become a Christian. You can sit down. Thank you. See, I thought I was a Christian before I got married. My wife has been so kind to me to teach me. I didn't know the first thing about being a Christian. She showed me I don't know how to communicate well. She showed me that there are certain things that I was selfish in, and I thought that I was, oh, I thought I was, like, getting ready to have wings. You know, I got two covering my feet and, and two covering my face and, and two I was flying with. And she showed me, no, brother, you are earthbound. <laughs> See, what the Lord is trying to do for us here is he's trying to teach us. See, this right here, the table of showbread, this represents Bible study. What I say it represents? Bible study. This is Bible study. Now watch this. This is the three-legged stool of Christianity. If you're missing any one of these, your Christian experience is going to fall flat. And watch this. What's the next one? You have the table of showbread. Then what's this right here? The altar of incense. Okay. Skip. It's, yes, this is altar. Is it AR? Yes. Of incense, okay? Is it I N? Thank you so much. This represents the prayers of the saints, okay? So if you, all you do is read your Bible, but you don't pray, you will soon cease to, pr to read your Bible. If all you do is pray, you've heard of these convents where the cloistered nuns, which Sister Charlotte tells us, is nothing more than a brothel. That's what Sister Charlotte said. If you don't know who Sister Charlotte is, go to YouTube, type in Sister Charlotte's testimony, and be prepared to cry a lot. She escaped from being a cloistered nun where they were supposed to pray, and all they really did was suffer. It was the worst form of Christianity. And so this is the second leg of your stool, which is prayer. Now, once you have Bible study... Once you began to pray, the next thing on the list is this here. This is called the menorah. Okay. And this is the candlestick. Anybody want to know what the candlestick is a representation of? The candlestick is witnessing. Listen, you can't be a witness without the power of God's spirit. And you don't know who to witness to or when to witness or what to do if you don't study God's word. See, God's word gives you the instructions on how to do the things, when to do the things, why to do the things. Prayer gives you the power to do the things, and witnessing is the thing you do. You understand? See, this is the gospel plan. But how should we pray? That's the question. Matthew 6, verse 5 through 15. Matthew 6, 5 through 15. And when thou prayest, Thou shalt not be as the, what's that word right there? Hypocrites. Hypocrites or actors are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be what? <clears throat> See, there are those Christians who want everybody to believe that they're Christians. Look at me, look at me, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. They walk around and they go to church with the big hats and and the, and the gaudy jewelry, and, and they do all these things, that's not Christianity. You know what Christianity is? It's a humble and contrite heart. 
A Christian is a person that realizes that they are weak. And that, you know what, if I am so weak, then everybody around me must be just as weak as I am. And that's why they pray. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Verse 6. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy what? Thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray unto thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee how? Openly. But when ye pray, use not, what's that word right there? Vain repetitions. This is why praying the rosary doesn't do anything. If there are any Catholics that are watching me, Jesus loves you. The rosary cannot save you. Vain repetitions are exactly what Jesus said not to do. As, you know, go say 50 Hail Marys. What's Mary going to do? She dead. As the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Anybody in here have somebody that talks to them so much and all you do is you end up turning off, not even hearing anything they say? Verse 8. Be ye not therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye have need of. When? So before you get on your knees, God already knows what you need. God knows you're not praying to inform God. You know what you're praying to do? You know what prayer does, saints? Prayer is supposed to change you. Prayer is not about you getting what you want from God. Prayer is about making you what you need to be in order for you to do whatever it is you need to do. See, prayer is the opportunity for you to be broken up on the rock. That's why many people, when they pray, they want to pray real fast. Oh, Father in heaven, amen, let's, let's eat. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our what? Daily bread. Daily bread. I'm sorry. This is for the saints who struggle with wanting to know what's going to happen tomorrow. Ladies who want to control the things in your life. This is a rebuke for you and me. See, Trying to plan out what's going to happen so that you don't have a disappointment is not what God said we should do. He said, give us what? This day, our daily bread. Sufficient for the day is the evil thereof, he said in another place. Stop trying to control your circumstances and get control over yourself. That's what God is trying to teach us. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive not men, if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you your trespasses. So, how should we pray? It seems like a small thing, praying, but it's not. It's a big thing. Here's the prayer formula. When you pray, enter into your closet. This is your praying in secret. This is you praying in private. When you pray, you're not praying so everybody in the world can know. Now, this is not necessarily talking about when you pray uh, in public or if you pray uh, with other people. But even still, when you're praying here at church, we're not praying so that, so that everybody in the world can know what we're praying for. We're praying so that we can receive whatever it is that we need from God at that time. It says, shut thy door. Does anybody want to... Uh, where's the microphone? Son, come out here, please. If you know what it means to shut your door, please raise, raise your hand. What does it mean, shut your door? 
No one? Go ahead, in the back. Uh, it means close out all outside the track. That's exactly right. Anyone else? All right. To shut your door is to close out all distractions. It's so that you can be open and honest with God and talk about anything and everything you need to talk about. This is why it's important. It says go into your closet. I remember I, when I first learned these things, I, had, I was doing Bible work with the pastor that was here last week. And we had an apartment. We had an um, apartment for the women, apartment for the women. We were doing Bible work. And there was a young man who took this to heart. And so he went into the closet in the bedroom and shut the door and was praying and opened the closet and was like, what are you doing? And I got on him a little bit. And then the Lord rebuked me like, no, he's doing exactly what I told him to do. This is so you can have privacy. And it says, pray to the father where? So listen, if you want God to do something for you, pray to him in secret. Why? Thy father which seeth in secret, he's going to reward you how? Openly. Openly. Don't use vain repetitions. You start off with praying to God the Father. You acknowledge that he is holy and separate from sin. That you're asking that his will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Anybody in here made of earth, please raise your hand. Okay. All right. So the rest of you, I'm not sure what you're made of, but I'm pretty sure I'm made of earth. You might be thinking I'm made of mostly of water. I got you. So that will be done in earth or in people or anything made of earth. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. Now, this is crucial. As we forgive our debtors, think of the person that hurt you the most. The thing that you have in your heart right now. And I want you to consider that the reason why your prayers aren't being answered is because you haven't forgiven them. That's the person that caused you the most amount of pain. But that person, is, that experience is blocking you from receiving from God. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but what? Deliver us from evil. Why? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And let the saints say, Amen. All right. So go with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts as we close out. Acts chapter 1. See, the Lord wants you to have power in your experience. It's the worst kind of thing to be a Christian and have no power. To profess the name of Christ and not be able to move the arm of God. This is the formula for moving the arm of God. This is how you get the God of the universe to obey you. I don't mean obey you like he's a, he's a chump and he has to do what you say. That's not what I'm saying. He's showing you the recipe for power. You're in your Bible in the book of Acts. In verse 4. Acts chapter 1 and verse 4. The Bible says... And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye heard, ye heard of me. For John truly baptized with what? For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When, ye therefore, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Jerusalem? excuse me, to Israel. And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father hath put into his own power. But ye shall receive what? What did he promise you're going to have? Power. That word power is the word dunamis. It's the root word for dynamite. <laughs> dynamite. Can you imagine having dynamite come out of your mouth? Meaning whatever you say happens. That's what he's trying to give us. That's what the enemy is so scared of. Go with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 1. 
Let's give me Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. We're coming right back here. Luke chapter 10. Verse 17. Luke 10, 17. When you get there, just say amen. amen. Luke 10, 17. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you what? Power, power to tread upon what? Serpents. Serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Listen to me. Don't get power hungry. The power to raise the dead. The power to feed thousands, yea, millions. The power to move heaven and earth. All power is given unto me, and God gives you this power. But see, when you have power, this is how you can see whether somebody's good or not. How? See, how do you treat people that are below you? How do you treat people that are not as where you are? Are you kind? Are you merciful? Are you dictator? See, when you have power, you know what? Some people are like, oh, I can't wait to be the boss so I can boss everybody around. That's not kind of power that God does. He has all power. Does he boss you around? When's the last time he showed up to your house with a sword, the angel going, hey, how come you didn't study your Bible this morning? Hey, how come you got up out of bed and didn't pray? When's the last time you saw an angel show up with a sword because you didn't do something you knew you were supposed to do? That's not how God uses his power. Go back to Acts chapter 1, please. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, unto the uttermost part of the earth. See, there's one last thing I want to give you. It says this, John 16, 23. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye ask the Father, what? In my name, he will give it you. So what if you pray and you don't pray in Jesus' name? How much can you expect to get? What if you pray directly to Jesus? How much did you expect to get? Why? Because what did Jesus tell you? See, listen, this is what I was saying. Bible study tells you what to do, when to do, and how to do. Prayer gives you the power, right? Look what it says in verse 24. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. And at that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say, say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself does what? Do you believe that? Some of us had piss poor fathers. My dad was wealthy. They, in Chicago, he and his wife, they owned a chain of child care centers. Do you know what he did for me my whole life? Nothing. You know who he cared about? Himself. I was an embarrassment. His father was a pastor. He was a good man, everybody thought. And he was more concerned about tarnishing his name, about having had a child out of wedlock, than by doing the right thing. See, I know what it's like not to have a good dad. But let me tell you something. Just because your dad wasn't a good dad, doesn't mean that God the Father is not a good dad, because he loves you. He loves you. He understands, the Bible says in the book of Psalms, he understands all the circumstances of your life. It doesn't matter how bad things were. He says, because I love you. Because ye have loved me and believed that I came forth, came out of God. So, 
I want us to exercise now. I want us to break up. What time is it? Honey, what time is it? Okay. I would like you to go around and to find, try to pray with at least half the people in the church. To kneel and to pray. Ask the person, what would you like me to pray for? And then go to that, then, then, then you do that. Now watch this. After about the third person, you're going you're gonna to run out of things to pray for. And that's when it gets real. So this is what we're going to do for the next 10 or 15 minutes. So right now, just go ahead and rise up. Try to pray with at least half the people. These aren't long prayers. These are short prayers to the point. And try to pray with people you didn't come to church with. All right, let's go ahead and do that. Go now, go pray, son. Father in heaven, thank you so much.
Okay, so there are some that are finishing up their prayers, and, uh, but let us go ahead and start gathering back together. <clears throat> the Lord has promised to pour out His Spirit. Amen. And we accept His promise. Let me... Okay. The Bible says in the book of Joel, chapter 2. The Bible says in the book of Joel, chapter 2. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. Amen. The pattern to the outpouring of the Spirit in Acts, chapter 2, is the experience in Acts, chapter 1. And so I'm grateful for this. So at this time, we're going to separate um, for foot washing and for um, and then we'll come back after foot washing men downstairs, women upstairs. We'll come back for that um, and then we'll have uh, the ordinances and we will conclude our service. All right. You may be separated. <clears throat>